Hey everybody, Jason here from Meridio, and today we're going to take a look at the 6G and 6A PC software that comes free with these two pieces of test equipment. Um, I know a lot of folks out there, uh, I see a lot of familiar names on the webinar today. I know a lot of folks out there probably already use these pieces. Um, so this hopefully will give you some tips and tricks how to really unlock the full potential of what these uh, devices are capable of. They're very powerful tools as is, and of course we can do lots of things by using the front panel controls and, and things like that. But uh, there are some tests you can do and there are some things you, that you can, go, you can do to dive a bit deeper uh, into the capabilities of these devices. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time today going through the 6A and the 6G and uh, just showing you guys the PC software, uh, where to get it, uh, give you a couple tips and tricks along the way and just show you, uh, show you what the uh, software is totally capable of. Um, I don't have a bunch of PowerPoints and slides to go through with you guys today. This is more of a, more of a tutorial type of webinar. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, um, I'm basically going to show you the PC software, where to download it, and then we're going to go through it together. Uh, if you guys do have any questions throughout uh, the tutorial today, feel free to type those in, in the question box. I've got um, our marketing director, Tom Devines, hanging out today, and uh, Brady from Product Development. He works directly with, with Matt Murray, our CTO. Uh, we've got those guys here to field some questions. In case you guys have some questions, feel free to type those in. I'll be checking the question box kind of periodically throughout the tutorial today. And then we'll leave some time at the end too uh, for a couple of questions in case you do have some questions at the end. Uh, so with that being said, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And you guys should see the Meridio website right now. Tom, can I get a quick thumbs up that you can see the website? We sure can, Jason. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I do wanna point out too, uh, Tom brought up something on this morning's webinar. In case you guys are having problems uh, seeing the screen at all, there is a slider tool in the webinar software that will let you uh, make the um, make the screen sharing bigger or smaller or whatnot. So feel free to use that slider if you guys wanna make your screen bigger and things like that. Uh, okay, with now that being said, I will uh, go ahead and get started. What I've got here with me is a uh, Meridio 6A and 6G, of course. And uh, with each one of these devices, uh, I'm gonna plug them into the laptop here via a USB cable. It's going to be a micro USB, of course. Uh, I do have power plugged in as well. I did charge them overnight last night, but as we're going through the presentation today, uh, I want to go ahead and plug them in for you. No big deal there. And then I also have the HDMI connected to a little Samsung monitor that I'm looking at over here because we are going to do some uh, different things with reading edits and whatnot. So I want to show you some of that stuff. So I've got it plugged in HDMI. But really, guys, that's about, about all I've got. I've just got the two units uh, plugged in for power, plugged in for USB, and plugged in for HDMI. So with that being said, if you take a look at the uh, the uh, screen that I've got up right now. This is a uh, meridio.com. This is where you're going to download that free uh, PC software for the 6A and 6G. So if you navigate over to meridio.com, we're going to go over here to the download section. Now the download section on the Meridio site has a ton of stuff on it. Uh, you know, manuals and things like that, cut sheets. Um, you can get the API for these devices if you need to by emailing us. There's diagrams, different photos, the different software packages for the different Meridio products are here. There's also some drivers here as well, in case you need drivers for the 6A and 6G, those are available. A lot of the test patterns that you see on the 6G, those are available for download here, which is nice, in case you wanna download those, put them on a thumb drive or have them handy. Um, you can also download the pattern uploader software here as well. So if you do have a custom test pattern that you wanna to upload to the 6G, you can also download that here from the website. You also have the different firmware uh, for the 6A and 6G. So if you take a look at the 6G firmware, uh, there's going to be a couple of different firmware packages uh, based on whether you have a Gen 1 or Gen 2 6G. So just make sure to uh, read the instructions here if you're going to download the firmware. Make sure you're getting the right version for the right uh, piece of hardware. Then you've also got the 6A software and firmware. That's going to be down here. Here's for the 6A Gen 2. Uh, here's some stuff for the Fox and Hound firmware. Uh, firmware for the Prisma if you guys have one of those. So the Meridio downloads page is going to have tons of stuff for you here. If there's anything that you need that you might not see listed here, uh, feel free to give us a call anytime or, or shoot me an email anytime and, and we can track anything down that you need to. One thing I do wanna share with everybody before we really get too deep, I'm gonna go ahead and share a file into the, um, into the webinar here so everybody can have a um, copy of it. It's in the handout section. I'm gonna drop it in right now, it's a spreadsheet. Uh, it's, uh, spreadsheet's got some pretty valuable data on it and uh, we'll take a look at that a little bit later, but uh, everybody, Go ahead and download that spreadsheet, keep it. If you need it in the future for any reason, I'll just let me know. Uh, but I did just share that with everybody, so you should have that now. So what we're gonna do first here is we're gonna download the 6G PC control software right here. 
And I'm also gonna download the 6A PC control software, which is gonna be right here. Now, one thing that's common with these, I've seen this a lot with on multiple different laptops, uh, Windows maybe doesn't recognize this download, so it does give you sort of a, a warning that it might be dangerous. Don't worry, guys, it's not dangerous, no big deal. Just make sure to tell Windows to keep these files. You will notice, too, that the 6G software is a zip file. Uh, there's a, some documents and some other things in there, uh, so you will have to unzip it. So let's go ahead and do that now because we're going to take a look at the 6G software first. I'm going to go ahead and extract. And I'm going to extract to my desktop here and extract. Okay, great. Now on my desktop, I have a folder called Meridio 6G 2.01. That's going to be the software. I'm going to go and open that up. And then here's a software package right here, unzipped, ready to rock. I'm going to go ahead and open that up. Again, Windows is going to warn you that they don't recognize the software. No big deal. Just press more info and then click run anyway. And after you do that, then boom, here we go. And there's the software. So let me minimize this screen. So this is probably a little bit easier to see. And this is the 6G software, guys. Uh, so I do have it plugged in, USB, like I said before, also plugged in for power. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the 6G on. It's powering up right now. And just FYI, guys, if you're not sure about the firmware on your 6G or 6A, Let's go ahead and turn this closer to the camera so maybe you can see. Once you fire the Meridio 6G up, it's in the same place on the 6A as well. In the upper right corner, I've got a rev number. I'm sorry the camera's not picking it up all that well, but the rev number on this is 2.64. The rev number on the 6A is 2.24, I believe. And for these units, that's the uh, most up-to-date firmware. If you do have a Gen 2 unit, the most up-to-date firmware is 3.02, so make sure, to, uh, make sure to get those updated if you're not updated. Uh, if you have any questions on the updates or if even if you want us to do the update for you, we're happy to do that. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email or give us a call. And either myself or uh, one of the folks from tech support uh, can log into your computer and uh, help you with that firmware update. It's not hard to do. It just takes about 20 minutes and it is a two step process. So if it looks if it looks confusing, if you don't want to uh, fiddle with it, that's OK. Uh, feel free to give us a shout. We do this for people all the time. Uh, so right now I'm plugged in USB, plugged in power, plugged in HDMI. We're gonna go up here to the upper left corner and click search device. Now that black light turned red and I've got a COM8 for my COM port. So that means I'm connected, it's that simple. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna run through all the different boxes here, explain what those do. We'll run through the different um, tabs here, explain what all these tabs do, go through all the different features and functions and tests. And then we'll do the same thing for the 6A. So now that we're connected to the 6G, we'll take a look on the left side of the software here. On this box, we have an address management page with a drop-down screen. Now, nine times out of 10, the average integrator, the average calibrator is probably not gonna use this. What this is for is if you had multiple units that you were running some tests on, you can address those units. So if I had you know, four Meridio 6G generators plugged in, I could give each one of those a specific address. That way I know, you know which generator I'm controlling with the software. That's all that is. I've never really used it too much. Uh, and most integrators and calibrators probably aren't going to use that too often, but that's what that is in case you were wondering. It tells us down here that the hot plug is on because I am plugged in HDMI to the Samsung monitor. The HDCP right now is currently turned off. It's outputting RGB full, 36-bit uh, color depth, uh, 1080p 60, and the down at the bottom are your stats for the audio output. So 48K, 16-bit, two-channel PCM, all common stuff here. This tells you the output. Now, if we go across the top, now we can pick different options for the output. The first tab here is the timing tab. And from here, I can pick a specific resolution, anything I want. So if I needed a VESA resolution, uh, you know, 1280 by 768, for example, I could click this and boom, now I'm outputting that resolution. Standard video resolutions are down here on the second column. So if I needed, you know, 1080p 60, boom, it's there, 1080p 24, boom, it's there. And of course, guys, you can do this with the front panel controls on the generator. This is nice because you can just you know pick one you want, click it. You don't have to navigate through a bunch of different pages and things like that. This is a lot quicker. There's also some 50 and 25 frames per second uh, formats down here for the European guys. And then down here in this 4K timing section, you've got a bunch of different 4K resolutions. So if I wanted to go 4K 24, if I wanted to go 4K 60, if I want to go 4K 30, whatever the case is, I can pick that here with just a touch of a button. The next section down is 3D. So if I wanted to go 720, 
if I want to go 1080p, 720, different frame rates, I can do that with my 3D signals as well. Also down here at the bottom, there's an auto setting as well. So if I have the generator plugged into a display and select auto here, the generator is going to read the edit of the display and just respond to that accordingly. So if the edit of the display says 1080p or 4K or 720p or whatever the case is, the, uh, the generator will just respond to that and put out that format, that resolution, that frame rate, those types of things. So that's what auto does. And then down at the bottom, you've got 10 slots for user-defined timing. So let's say you were doing a custom project and you needed a custom resolution. You can actually make a custom resolution with the software. And there's 10 slots to save those. And you can save them in any of those 10 slots and you can just access those at any time as well. I don't see a whole heck of a lot that a whole a heck of a lot of that going on from my perspective. Um, but I'm sure there's plenty of applications out there where you might want to do a custom resolution for a certain, you know, uh, screen size, or maybe you're doing a custom install. Um, at, you know, say you're doing a fashion show or something, and you need to do some test patterns at a certain resolution to fit a certain screen. Anything custom you want to do, you can do that as well, which is nice. Then move on to the next tab. That's the 4K geometry tab. What I like about this, this will actually give me this uh, uh, ISF geometry test pattern in a native 4K resolution. And that becomes very handy when you're setting up a TV or a projector and you're trying to get the geometry all correct, you're trying to get the sharpness set correctly, making sure the overscan is turned off or turned on or whatever the case is. So if I pick one of these 4K resolutions, now the generator is gonna output a native 4K signal for this specific test pattern. So if we're using a typical 1920 by 1080 output, on the generator and we pull up the ISF geometry test pattern, you'll notice that the pixels are counted 0 to 1920, left to right, and 0 to 1080, north and south or up and down. Now that's fine if you're working on a 1080p display because you can see exactly where the pixels are, you can set your sharpness, you can look for the diamond shape in the test pattern to set your resolution, your aspect ratio, things like that. But if I do it in this page and I select you know, 3840 by 2160, now this test pattern is gonna be in its native resolution. So instead of 1920, we're gonna go zero to 3840. And instead of 1080, we're gonna go zero to 2160. And of course, that's gonna be in the native resolution. So these will sharpen up, the lines will get a lot smaller, a lot tighter. And if you're doing native 4K on a 4K display, this is a great test pattern and a great way to use this to uh, make sure all those adjustments are set correctly. Next, we're gonna to go to the timing details page. This is where I can do some custom stuff if I'd like to. So if I wanted to make a, a custom resolution, I can do that on this page. I can choose whether that resolution or that format's gonna be progressive or interlaced. I can do a couple of different things here. So if I had a specific custom resolution in mind, I can type in all my stats here, all my parameters, and click update status. And then I'm gonna have my custom resolution saved to one of the user-defined settings. So I can come over here, user-defined one, type in the parameters, hit update. And now user one on the Meridio 6G under the custom resolutions is gonna be this resolution that I just made right here. So if you are gonna make some custom resolutions, feel free, you can do that on this timing detail page. Next is a test pattern page. This is, uh, this is really handy because now I have access to all the test patterns in the generator by the click of a button. And you guys know, especially if you use the 6G before, I could pick it up and I could find the test patterns and click up and down a bunch of times and find the test pattern I want. But this makes me a little more efficient. You know, if I want the uh, RGB ramp, boom, it's right there. If I want the horizontal split, boom, it's right there. If I want the white contrast pattern, boom, it's right there. I can get to my test patterns by the click of a button here. So it can make me go a little bit quicker as well. The next tab over is gonna be the setting tab. A lot of this is gonna to have to do with the output of the generator. So the first box that you see up here is the HDMI slash DVI box. Now, as we know, the 6G has an HDMI connection, but in some cases you might wanna use DVI. And in that case, that's fine. You just have to use an HDMI to DVI adapter. If you're gonna use an HDMI to DVI adapter, you must select DVI as your output on this uh, box right here, or you can do this on the front panel controls of the generator. Now, if you select auto, that should automatically detect whether it's DVI or HDMI and switch to the correct output for you. But you can also do it manually too. So if I'm out outputting DVI with an adapter or from outputting HDMI, I can click these boxes. Now, of course, we're using HDMI here today. So I'm just gonna leave HDMI selected. The second box down is your HDCP selection. There's three choices here. HDCP off, HDCP 1.4, HDCP 2.2. This is really handy, guys, when you're trying to test the infrastructure of a system. You might have a system that has a mix of old components, new components. 
And you have to make sure that the signal is getting from point A to point B. And you have to make sure that all those components are in agreement with the version of HTCP that we're working with. As you know, if you've done this uh, type of uh, work for a long time, if you try to send uh, HTCP 2.2 through an AVR that can't do it, uh, you run into all kinds of problems. And sometimes firmware is not gonna fix that. Sometimes that AVR is just too old and you can't upgrade it for HTCP 2.2. So the idea here is you can start with HTCP off. Now let's imagine now you've got a distributed video system or maybe you just have a really, uh, a, a very complex signal chain. So you've got a source, an AVR, an extender, a matrix switch, you know, and then the display. Maybe you've got four or five things in the signal chain. If I turn the HTCP off on the generator, and I do get a picture on the other end, then I know that the integrity of the uh, of the signal chain, I know that the integrity of the infrastructure is good. I am getting another, I am getting picture on the other side, so that's great. If I go to HDCP 1.4 and I still get a picture on the other end, that means all the components in that signal chain are capable of HDCP 1.4. All good, no problem. Now if I go to HDCP 2.2 and I don't have a picture on the other end, I know that something in the signal chain is not capable of HTCP 2.2, not able to pass it. So I can start troubleshooting and investigating from there. Sometimes it could be a firmware update on a player, sometimes it could be firmware on an AVR, lots of different things could cause this. I do like to start when I'm troubleshooting with the HTCP off, just to make sure I'm getting picture on the other end. That lets me know all my, conne all my connections are good uh, and nothing's broken in that sense. It's most likely an HTCP thing. So you can toggle that here, which is handy. And of course you could do it on the generator as well on the front panel controls. But here you can do it a lot easier. So as far as the output goes on the color space, I can choose RGB full, RGB limited, YUV or YCBCR444, 422 or 420. Or I can select auto as well. If I select auto, that's going to respond to the EDID of whatever the display is that I'm plugged into. And it'll output whatever the display is asking for. So that's where I can pick that. Next is the color depth. I can pick between 24 bit, 30 bit, 36 bit. 48 bit and then auto. Of course, auto, just like on the color space, auto will respond to the EDID and put out whatever the display is asking for or whatever the sync device is asking for. Or I can manually choose 24, 30, 36, 48. Now these are broken up into three channels, don't forget. So this is you know eight bit, you know, eight times three is 24. This is 10 bit, this is 12 bit, 16 bit. Now the next uh, selection down is audio source selection. As you guys probably know, the 6G is capable of putting out some audio test tones. Now this selection that we're gonna make right here tell, is telling the generator where those test tones come from. So if I pick the first selection here, internally generated, that means the test tone is gonna to come from the generator itself. It does have some test tones built in. But maybe I have something a little more advanced that I wanna use. Maybe I have some uh, music or something that I use as reference. The 6G does have a, a 3.5 millimeter stereo input as one of the connections as well. So if I select this, now all of my test tones are going to from, come from that external source. So I would take my external source with a 3.5 millimeter, plug it into the 6G, and then I would select this here. And now I'm going to get my test tones or my audio signals from something else other than the 6G. So if you have anything in mind or anything on hand that you like to use for your audio testing and things like that, you certainly can do that. Or you could just keep it simple and stick with the internal test tones that the 6G has built in. Next down is the sample rate. You can pick whatever sample rate you want all the way up to 192. Uh, again, if you click auto, anytime you see auto on these pages, guys, auto means that response to the edit of the sync device. I'll just leave it at 48 for now, no big deal. And then you can select your bit depth as well. Same thing, 16, 20, 24, and then auto. Now down at the bottom, this is nice. You can select your output, your channels. So I can select two channel. I can come down here, I can select 5.1. If I'm using HDMI for my test tones, of course, I'm not gonna be able to do this with analog, but you have got 7.1 here as well. So if I wanna run test tones through specific channels, I can do that as well. I'm not gonna do any of that here today. Just wanna show you the settings and show you that what it does. I'm gonna go back to two channel. Now one of the other things that the generator does to save battery and to save its life, to save the battery's life at least, is the, the generator does have a, uh, a uh, auto power off function. So if you leave the generator alone for 10 minutes or so and don't touch any buttons and, and don't do anything with it, the generator will automatically turn off to save the battery life. You can disable that. In case you are doing some tests that require uh, the thing to run for more than 10 minutes, uh, in some cases you might be even doing some tests that, run, that take hours sometimes, uh, especially if you're doing some troubleshooting. So if you disable this, then the, the generator will stay on um, 
even if there's no signal or no connection to it. Again, you might want this, you can do it here. I'm just gonna leave it enabled for now, no big deal. Now, if you ever wanna go back to the default settings, you can click this reset the default setting down here, no big deal. And now you're back to the regular default, you know, uh, preset settings that the generator comes with from the factory. Good stuff. Okay, uh, looks like a question came in. Let me grab that really quick. Um, Daniel says, do these auto settings tell you what is selected? Uh, Daniel, no. Um, it it says auto. If you pick auto, it'll respond to the EDID of the sync device. Now, you could read the EDID of the sync device and know what those parameters are. So when you do select auto, you know what's going on. You could do that. You could also use the analyzer as well. You could do that two different ways. But if you select auto on any of these pages, any of these selections, auto is going to respond to the EDID of the sync device. So if the sync device, uh, you know, the sync device says 444 and you select auto, that's what's going to do is 444. Cool. Hopefully that helps. Okay, great. Uh, next tab, we're going to look at some EDID stuff. So right now I've got the 6G plugged into a, a little Samsung display right here. So I want to do a couple of things. We can do an EDID read on the front panel itself. We're going to save the EDID to slot number one. It says success on the generator, so I know it's saved. Now, if I go here to save number one on this dropdown and read the EDID, now I've got the EDID of this Samsung display. Now, of course, you can use the generator to read the EDID right off the bat, but it's only going to tell you so much. And most of that information is going to be helpful, and almost everything that you need to know on a daily basis for troubleshooting and things like that is going to be there. But sometimes you might need to go a little deeper, and that's where this page will help you. If you're at an engineering level and you need to know the hex code of the EDID, boom, it's right here. This long string of code right here is the EDID of this TV. You can save this EDID. Maybe you're doing a project where you have multiple displays of, of different manufacturers and different capabilities, and you need the EDID of this TV because you know this TV you know, shows, and it shows a picture and does everything it's supposed to do. I can save this EDID and use it later for something else if I want to, because remember, it is saved into the generator at this point. Now, if you look at the general info page of the uh, of the EDID here, uh, we've got SAM here for Samsung. Uh, there's a product code, which I'm sure somebody at Samsung would know what that is. Probably has something to do with the size and the and the model. Uh, tells you a little bit about the video signal, color depth, uh, refresh rates, uh, clock rates, um, color spaces that it's asking for. Uh, as you see right here, this is not an HDR monitor, so it says HDR no support. There's even some more information down here at the bottom. So if you look at this, this is interesting. The preferred timing resolution of this monitor is 1366 by 768, which is really like a PC signal, right? But if we're doing video, it has a preferred timing of 1280 by 720. So if I plug in a PC, I get this resolution. If I plug in a video product, I get this resolution. Now there's also some other resolutions that it supports as well. And again, this is all in the EDID. So for example, if I plug in a device that cannot output 768, maybe it can output 720. If it can't output 720, maybe it can do 1920 by 1080i. If it can't do that, it goes to the next one. If it can't do that, it goes to the next one. So the way the EDID works is it, take, it responds to the first one. The, the source will respond to the first one. And if it can't respond to the first one, the EDID of the TV will keep asking for these different resolutions until, there's, until the source says, oh yeah, okay, there's one I can do. And it'll send that out. There's some more information down here as well, different resolutions, different aspect ratios, different frame rates. So this is all in the EDID information. Now, if you look over into the box to the right, that's your audio EDID information as, as well there. So you've got your audio format, how many channels, you know, your uh, frequencies, your bit depths, all the different things that have to do with the audio is over here as well. So a lot more going on here than what you just see on the little LCD screen right there, which can be very handy if you're doing some deep dive stuff. Okay, cool. Let's move on to the next page. This is the RGB triplet page. Now what I can do here is I can make my own custom triplets. And what that means is if I, if I say a triplet, what that means is I've got these different values that'll let me determine what color the test patterns are. And I've got a window size selection down here that'll let me choose how big the test pattern is. So let's take a look at this. Uh, we know in video, at least 8-bit video, uh, we're looking at a range of 16 to 235. So this is broken up into odd pixels and even pixels. If all of my odd pixels have values of 235, 235, 235, 
That means all of the odd pixels in this test pattern are gonna be white. If I go over here to the even pixels, same thing, 235, 235, 235, odd plus even, they're all the same values. That means I'm gonna get a white test pattern up on the screen. Now, how big that test pattern is, I can customize that here if I want to. Sometimes you might want a 25% test pattern. Sometimes if you're working on maybe an OLED, for example, you want a 10% pattern. Maybe you're working on an LCD panel, you want a 100% test pattern, which means it fills the screen up all the way. You can totally customize that here as much as you want to. If we go to the second column here, the second row, we've got the background color setting. So if all the odd pixels are 16, 16, 16, that's black. All the even pixels are 16, 16, 16, that's also black. That means I've got a black background with a white test pattern that's 25% of the size of the entire screen. And you guys have seen this many times, I'm sure. You've got a black background, a rectangle-shaped white test pattern up on the screen. Here on this page, you can customize this and, and do whatever you want with it, which in a lot of cases, uh, you, uh, you might want to do. This is also interesting, too. If you leave the, uh, the scrolling feature disabled, the test pattern will just sit on the screen and it'll never move, just like what you're probably used to in the past. But maybe you're working on an OLED, or maybe you're working on something that you don't want to have to worry about burn-in or something like that. You can make the test pattern scroll if you want to. So if I enable the scrolling, the rectangle in the middle of the screen that we're used to seeing will scroll. It'll go kind of in a loop. It'll just keep scrolling infinitely until you stop it. I don't need that right now, so I'm just going to leave it on disable. And then the mode over here, I can choose between normal and Dolby Vision and HDR. I'm just going to leave it on normal now because the display I'm plugged into can't do Dolby Vision or HDR. Now, once I type in all my parameters here, I pick my test pattern color. I pick my background color, I pick the size, whether it scrolls or not, whether it's Dolby Vision or HDR or normal. I click update to machine and then boom, it loads into the machine and now I'm gonna see that test pattern up on the screen. And then last but not least on this page, we've got a BT2020 check. So I can either disable it or enable it. This monitor I'm plugged into right now cannot do 2020 or HDR or anything like that. So in this case, I'm just gonna leave this as disabled. Now, last but not least, there's an HDR tab. And this is where that spreadsheet that I shared with everybody uh, is going to come in handy. So feel free to download that, take a look at that. I can get one to you if, if you need an extra copy for any reason, just let me know. So when you select your different HDR selections on the generator, you guys have probably noticed this before if you've done this manually at least. When I scroll through the Meridio 6G menu and I get to the HDR setup page, the first selection is HDR off. I don't know if you can see that well, probably not. The first selection is HDR off, and then there's eight or nine slots that say HDR DRM info one, HDR DRM info two, info three, info four, and so on and so on. The question we get all the time is, what do those mean? Is one Dolby Vision? Is one of those for HDR 10? Is one of those for HLG? What are these? What does this all mean? So the spreadsheet that I've got for you guys is sort of a guide to that. So we take a look at the spreadsheet, slot DRM1, this gives you all of the parameters and stats for slot number one. So slot number one is 10,000 nits, P3D65. Here's my white point. Here's my red, green, and blue, my primary colors. That's gonna determine the size of the triangle. Maximum light level for the content. Minimum uh, average light level for the content. And then of course you have the um, the AVI info frame over here as well. So when I inject this data into that, that metadata into that signal, that's what's gonna give me 10,000 nits P3D65. Now a few of these are repetitive. So if you take a look at, oops, take a look at the very beginning here. Oops, wrong way, there we go. I've got two different slots here for 10,000 nits. So I've got my maximum, my minimum, maximum, average. I've got a 600 nit, a 540, a 4000, a 10,000, a 250, a 1000, and a 540. Now what's interesting about this, guys, if you had your own metadata and you had your own specific custom parameters you wanted to inject into the generator, you can certainly do that with the software. So I could take that hex code, I could pop it into here, and I can turn that on to any of these selections that I want to, which is nice. If you're on the design side of things or engineering side of things, and you wanna test a TV for a certain amount of nits, and none of the presets are gonna work for you, you can make a custom one, no big deal. 
Now this guide, this really guys, this spreadsheet's really just a guide. So let's say for example, you're calibrating a 1000 nit monitor, then I might wanna use the 1000 nit um, uh, AVI info frame. But again, I can go 540, 4000, 10,000. The three common ones that you're gonna use most likely are 1000, 4000, 10,000, because that's what most of the content is all mastered at, at least right now. Most of it's at 1,000, I've seen some 4,000, and very, 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 very little 10,000. Most of it right now is 1,000, handful of titles at 4,000. So that's all that is, guys. Feel free to download that, keep it, uh, keep a copy of it. Uh, that way you remember which, which slot means what on the generator. Okay, now, with that being said, uh, that's all I've got on the 6G software. So if nobody has questions, and I don't see any in right now, let's move on to the 6A software. So what I'm going to do is take my 6G, unplug everything, and I'm going to take my 6A, plug in the power, plug in the USB, and then plug in the HDMI. Now there's going to be a couple of tests that we do this time on the 6A that we'll need the 6G for. So I'm going to unplug my HDMI cable from the monitor and I'm going to plug it into the 6G. Boom and boom. So I've got the 6G plugged in directly to the 6A. There's a couple tests that we'll take a look at here. Okay, so I'm going to go to my downloads page. I'm going to find my 6A software, which is the little blue icon right here. Put this on my desktop, open it up, and then drag it back over here so you guys can see it. More info. Again, this is just yelling at you saying, hey, we're Windows. We don't recognize the software. That's no big deal. Click run anyway. And... Ta-da, you've got your 6A software right here. So a lot of this is gonna look kind of familiar to you. Um, it looks a lot like the 6G software. There's not as many tabs, and there's a, a couple of different things you have to do here. Uh, a couple of different tests you can run here that you can't run with, with just the 6G alone. So the first thing I wanna do is search machine, and let me turn on the port. Do this actually real quick. Let me do a quick disconnect, reconnect, and just do a quick power cycle. Okay, here we go, let's try this again. And it is powered up. Search machine, that worked that time. Uh, I click search machine, I get a red light up here, it's COM11, I know I'm connected to the machine. Now, you may have seen some info just pop in right here. That's coming from the generator, so I'll go over that in just a second. Now, just like on the 6G, you might be running some tests where you have multiple 6As connected to your computer. I can open up this drop-down screen and I can assign them. So I know that I'm using generator one, or I'm sorry, analyzer one or analyzer four, analyzer three, uh, whatever the case is. I'm not gonna do any of that now because I'm only using one machine, no big deal. Down here, I can pick my HDCP version just like in the 6G. Down here shows me the received signal info. So right now the 6G is outputting no HDCP. It's an HDMI connection worth 2160 at 30 frames per second, RGB 444, 48 bit color. Uh, 2D, not 3D, uh, audio sample rate of 48K, audio bit depth of 16 bits, uh, PCM signal with two channel audio. So this tells me exactly what's coming into the analyzer. If I change stuff on the 6G, like maybe if I go to, let's pick another resolution, I'll go uh, 1080p 30, you'll see this kind of refresh. And as soon as they sync up to each other, you'll see the uh, the info pop into here. Over here is the detailed info. So if you wanted to see exactly what the pixel clock is and uh, what the resolution is and things like that, down to the specific details, you can certainly do that as well. Okay. Next page is the color checker. Uh, this is actually a really cool, uh, really cool page. Uh, there might be times where you need to, um, give me just a second here, let me switch this back over. There might be a time where you want to see what a specific color of a pixel is. Maybe if you are um, 
creating your own custom color checker test or something like that, this is where this comes in handy. So right now I've got the 6G set to output a SMPTE color bar pattern, and I'm receiving it on the 6A. Now if I go to my software here, there's a button here that says download image. We're gonna download the image. Now it's actually downloading the image that's coming into the 6A to the screen right here. So now I can see my test pattern, which again is a SMPTE color bar pattern. Now let's say, for example, I really needed to know what yellow this was, exactly what yellow that was. So on the left side of the screen here, you see the full image of the test pattern. The right side of the screen is gonna show you like the zoomed in version of that, um, of that test pattern, exactly where we're looking on the screen. So I'm gonna click right around here in the middle of the yellow bar, somewhere right around there. Now I've got some numbers down here. I've got my RGB values. This is the triplet for yellow. That specific pixel I clicked on is 180, excuse me, 180, 180, 15. Those are my triplet values. Now the pixel I clicked on was pixel 409 by 249. If I wanted to pick a different pixel, I can use my left button over here. Eventually if I click, I'm sorry, the right button. Eventually if I click the right button enough, I'm gonna move over into cyan. You can kind of see cyan creeping into the screen now. Again, all I'm doing here is going from this yellow to the right over to cyan. Now we're still yellow. Now, if I'm not sure exactly where I'm at and what pixel I've chosen, I can click this button here that says show pixel position. That's gonna tell me, boom, it's that pixel right there. So if I wanted to get over to the cyan, I could click on the cyan, or if I wanted to see the border between cyan and yellow, I could use my right arrow here and get really, really, really close to the border. And eventually I'll be into cyan which we're in a cyan now. And now we've got a different triplet value, 16, 180, 179. I'm reading pixel 567 by 378. So a really handy tool there, guys, in case you need to know specific colors of things. I've seen some studios in the past making like lookup tables and doing some custom stuff for movies. Uh, and they do need to know this information. Uh, so this is a little more advanced stuff, but it is there in case you need it. Uh, there's lots of times where, you know, you might want to know exactly what color a, a logo is for something. Uh, you could load that logo onto the 6G and you could do this test as well. There's actually something similar to this. If you use Google Chrome as your web browser, uh, I think they call it uh, color dropper, something along those lines. You can hover your mouse over any icon or any pixel on the screen. It'll tell you exactly what triplet value that is. It's kind of a cool tool, but this will do that for you with a lot more detail. Now down here, you've got your different audio channels. I'm not sending out any audio right now to the analyzer, so I'm not really seeing anything. But if I was playing audio, whether it was a test tone or some music or something through that external stereo input, you would see some, uh, you'd see some action down here of some stuff bouncing around. Okay, now let's, next, let's go to the utilities tab. Uh, this is actually something I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, guys. This is uh, more for engineers. I'm not even 100% clear on, on, on what this is all about because I've never had to use it before. Um, this is something that uh, if you need to use it for any reason, just give us a call. Uh, we'll get you in touch with, uh, with the right folks, uh, myself, Brady, or, or Matt even to, to help you with this. But again, I'm not, I'm not um, gonna go through this because I don't use it myself, but this has to do with uh, AVI info frames when you're talking HDR. So again, nothing crazy here to go over. If you do want a little more information, reach out. We'll get you all the information that we can. The next tab is your monitor tab. This is actually very, very cool. Uh, when when you go to a customer's house and the customer's saying, oh, the picture's flashing, and you show up and the picture's not flashing anymore, happens all the time. What you can do with the analyzer is you can leave it in the signal chain for as long as you want, overnight, all weekend, 10 days in a row, whatever you want. It's gonna monitor the signal into the analyzer. So if there's any kind of um, hot plug disconnection or any kind of uh, pixel dropping, uh, anything that's going on with the signal that's causing any of, any of that loss, We'll actually see that here on a graph. So what you can do is you can have it check, you know, every one second. If I pick one and choose seconds, or I can do it every minute. See so if I do every, if I check every pixel every second, I'm sorry, every minute, this test is gonna take one day and 10 hours. If I wanna check every pixel every second, this test will run, run for 34 minutes. You could also do a specific start and stop time if you want to as well. Now there's two things you can really look for here. The first option here under trigger mode, option number one says by frame image difference and loss of signal. So if a signal is coming in and 
some of those pixels are not being displayed, we'll get some errors here. And that could be caused by a lot of different things. Or I could test for a total signal loss. So if it loses the hot plug. So maybe there's a device in the system that's doing something funky when it power cycles. We're losing, we're losing the handshake, we're losing the hot plug. I can test for either, either the hot plug loss or I can test for frame loss or pixel loss. So just to show you kind of how this works, we're gonna go pixel by pixel. We're gonna set it to test every pixel every one second and just click new start. Now what you'll notice down here on the bottom, you don't see any information. All you're gonna see is a one or a zero. Zero is good, one means bad. So as the test is running right now, it's been running for a few seconds, I can click this read status button and it shows me a bunch of zeros for however many seconds it's ran so far. So you could set this to run as long as you want. So if I came back two days from now and all these were zeros, then I know that something else is causing this problem of the TV flashing or whatever, whatever the customer's complaint is. But if I come back here the next day and there's a bunch of mixes of zeros and ones in here, then I know something's going on with the signal chain and with the, with the signal integrity, and I can start doing some troubleshooting from there. Maybe it's a kinked HDMI cable, you know, who knows? But this is, where, this is where you can at least know where you're starting. There's also a save function down here as well. So I can log all of this. So maybe you're in a commercial job where you have to have everything documented and everything logged. You can log this, you can save it to a text file, and you can have all the proof right there that you need in case, in case you ever need it. So very, very cool test, very handy test. If you're doing a lot of troubleshooting, this is a good, uh, a good test to run. One other thing I do want to mention on this test real quick. Um, the way you test traditional HDMI cables, uh, you guys have probably seen this many times. We've got videos on our YouTube page. But if I was to test a regular old HDMI cable, I could plug one end into the generator, one end into the analyzer, and I can do a really simple cable test to make sure that cable's passing the resolution, the frame rate, the bandwidth, all those things that I want it to pass. You can't test the fiber optic based AOC HDMI cables the same way. With those cables, you would run a, run a signal monitor test just like what we're doing right now. So if I had an AOC cable plugged into the analyzer and I ran this test, I could test that cable for integrity as well. So just a couple little things you can do extra. Now for the last tab here is gonna be EDID. So let me plug the analyzer back into the monitor over here. Just give me just a moment. I'll go ahead and plug this back in. And we'll fire the camera back up. And boom, okay. So now, I'm gonna take the analyzer, which is now plugged in, HDMI to the display. We're gonna find the EDID page. And we're gonna copy this EDID of this display to user slot number one. Boom, I get a success, good to go. Great. Now, under EDID selection over here, I can pick user one, because that's what I just saved the EDID to, and then I can click read EDID from device. Now, this should look a little familiar to you. This is the EDID information that we saw in the 6G software. So all the same information is here. I just read the EDID of that specific display. Now, there are uh, eight user slots here, 10 user slots here. So you could do uh, custom EDIDs or you can read the EDID and save the EDIDs for up to 10 devices. And again, that might come in handy if you're doing a distributed system with multiple different brands, multiple different capabilities and whatnot, you can do that. Now there are also some built-in EDIDs here as well. So if you're doing some testing and troubleshooting, you can always use a built-in EDID. But if you have a known good EDID from a known good display where everything's working correctly, save it into the, um, save it into the analyzer. Now you, can, now you can take that analyzer around with you and basically, you're carrying this 32 inch Samsung monitor now in your hand, battery powered, go troubleshoot the rack, go troubleshoot your sources, all that good stuff, really cool. Now I can also save an EDID, maybe this is an EDID that I wanna save for future use because I know it's good, I know it works. I can save the EDID here, that's gonna save to a folder on my computer. So next time if I have this software open, I can go to open file, find that EDID, and then boom, I've got it back again. So it can save forever if you want it to. So guys, that's the last uh, that's the last tab on the software uh, page for the 6A analyzer. Uh, we've gone through the 6G already. Uh, I'll flip it back to you guys to see if there's any specific questions you might have, uh, or any comments, or a, maybe any experiences you might want to share from using these tools in this way. Uh, feel free, go right ahead. So far, one question has come in. 
Let me pop this out. Oh, that's Daniel's question from before. Okay, cool. Daniel, I hope that question was answered. If not, feel free to uh, just let me know. We can talk about it a little bit more. Okay. All right. Guys, I don't see any new questions coming in, and that's okay. Um, hopefully, this helped and gave you a couple tips and tricks on how to use the software. Uh, feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions. Uh, my email address is jason at avproglobal.com. You can also hit us up at info at meridio.com. If you hit any of our websites, whether it's Meridio, AV Pro, Bullet Train, whatever, there's also a chat function down here as well. So you can reach out to us anytime if you have any questions. Uh, Daniel says, wait, what's up, Dan? What do you got? And Dan, I can unmute you too if it's easier just to talk. You let me know. Okay, he says, uh, okay, I'm gonna unmute him. I think it'll be easier. Okay, give me just a second, Dan. Dan, are can you, you there? Me okay, can you hear me? Yeah, how you doing, man? Good, how are you? I'm great, man, thanks for, thanks for hanging out. A few weeks ago, I, I've had the 6A and 6G for, uh, a few years and cool. uh, kind of forget that I have them. So <laughs> a, a couple of months ago, we had a uh, a system that was flickering like hell. Yeah. And uh, it would stop for a while and then it would go on again. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at it. I already know there's something going on in the signal. Mm -hmm. I already know what's happening. Now, by process of, elim of elimination, it turned out to be the receiver which actually wasn't a surprise considering who it was made by. Sure. They don't handle video well. Mm -hmm. But how does this help me? How does this help me narrow that down? I mean, it gives me a solid signal source. Right. And it gives me a picture on the other end. The rest of this, I'm not sure it would have helped troubleshoot that system at all. And, and I'm kind of asking, what, what am I doing wrong? What am yeah. I not getting? So uh, give me a quick rundown, Dan, of the signal chain. Uh, I'm guessing source, AVR, display, or was there anything else in there too? Extender, one of your There was an extender. And the extender yeah. was um, AVR to display? Yeah, AVR to display. Okay, so let, me just, so let me just jot this down real quick so I have it in my mind clear. You've got source, AVR, Source was a Roku playing YouTube TV. Okay. Extender and display. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, perfect. I got it. Um, here's how I would have handled it. And you tell me if you did it a little bit differently or maybe you did it the same. In that situation, and, and, the, and the complaint, Dan, was that the uh, TV was flashing? Was that what it was? Yeah, it flickered. Okay. It, it, it would, the picture would jump. Okay, cool. Um, so you can really look at this two ways. You can start on the source end or you can start on the display end. So we'll kind of go over both. And you tell me, uh, well, tell me if that, that much is true. If we had pulled out the display and mm -hmm. plugged it into the analyzer and it still flipped, we'd know it wasn't the display. Right, That's yeah, that's a great way to start eliminating things. Okay. But what we did do is we bypassed, eventually we, well, not eventually, pretty quickly, we bypassed the receiver mm -hmm. and everything was fine. So we knew it was the receiver and then it was a matter of convincing the manufacturer. Right. And what you end up, what was the resolution? Did you end up just doing another AVR, just a totally different brand, or yeah, totally happened? different brand, a totally different brand, yeah. So there's really two ways you can do it. You can start on the source end, or you can start on the display end. So if we start on the display end, what I'd probably do is take uh, take one of the units and copy the edit of the display into say the generator, right? Then I can take the generator back to the source end and start pumping signal through from that end. Now, if it's still flashing, of course, we know the TV's edit is correct. We know we've got that saved into the machine. If it's still flashing, then that almost always tells us it's a hardware thing. The other way you could do it, too, is start on the source end. So if you know the source is the Roku and it's outputting, you know, let's just say for argument's sake, 1920 by 1080, and I mimic the source on the generator, mm -hmm. I could put the generator in place of the source and pump that signal through again. Now, if it's still flashing, I'm going to go to the next device in the signal chain. So in that case, it's the AVR. So if I put the generator in place of the AVR and there's no flashing, you know it's the AVR. But I think the way you did it was probably a, a very, very easy way to do it. And that type of troubleshooting 
Uh, I don't honestly know if opening up this software that we talked about today and all that stuff really would have given you any more of an advantage of just doing it the way you did it kind of manually anyway. Well, we, I could have eliminated the display and the source. Sure. Uh, sure. Using the two pieces. And since I own them, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. going to use them. Right. But, uh, you know, I've only used them in the past for calibrations, but I don't do too many calibrations anymore. Yeah. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll uh, I'll take care of that in the future. I think I'm just going to take these with me. I, I used to take a monitor with me and I'd leave it in the car, but when it got oh, really sure. cold, it died. Yeah. Well, yeah. I can't we, leave my test equipment in the car anymore. We actually, um, it should be releasing today or tomorrow, I believe. Maybe Tom, if you're still on, you could clarify that for me. I think it's today, actually. Uh, we have a brand new Meridio 7-inch test monitor, which has some of the functions of the analyzer built into it. And you can battery power it as well, which is kind of cool. Uh, we should be doing a webinar on that brand new product probably next week. So if any of you on the call or on the webinar uh, have any interest in a little handy test generator with some uh, analytical uh, functions built into it, uh, it's a really great little monitor and not very expensive at all. Uh, we were talking about yesterday how if you had a 6G but no 6A, uh, the monitor might be a great little, uh, great little addition to the 6G if that's all you had. So that should be pretty cool if you want to check that out. But yeah, I mean, there's there's so many different ways to do it. But uh, in that case that you had of the flashing picture, uh, I would start at the source, replace the generator, uh, replace the source with the generator. If it's still flickering, move on to the AVR. If it's still flickering, move on to the extender. If it's still flickering, it's the TV. So you can mm -hmm. kind of figure it out, figure it out that. Way. But again, with that specific problem you had, uh, Dan, I don't think uh, I don't think this advanced software of the 6A and 6G probably would have been a little overkill for for that situation. So. Okay. Cool. Hopefully that helps, guys. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the question box, but again, feel free to reach out if you guys do have any questions uh, later down the road. Uh, I did record this session. We'll get it posted up uh, in the next uh, day or so. So feel free to share away if any uh, any of your colleagues might use this equipment and might benefit from, from some of the stuff we talked about today. Feel free to share that. Uh, and uh, guys, that's all I got for you today. Uh, we do have webinars scheduled for the rest of the week, and we're, we're uh, uh, working on a schedule for next week with all new stuff. So feel free to stay tuned for that, and we'll uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan.